I recently upgraded to the ASRock Z890 Pro RS. I went with ASRock again for my motherboard choice since I had a great experience in using the ASRock Z690 Steel Legend, which served me well for several years. When choosing a motherboard, the most important things for me are the features, price, and aesthetics. Important motherboard features for me include CPU overclocking, RAM overclocking, BIOS flashback, built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, a handful of SATA ports, and enough USB slots so that I can use all of my peripherals. The price. Motherboard pricing has gone up in recent years, but so has the price of just about everything else. But the ASRock Z890 Pro RS comes in at a price that I'm comfortable with. There are two different models of this board, and two different color options. The standard edition of this board comes in at 219 which is a solid option, but for $10 more, at 229 you can get the Wi-Fi version of this board, which includes a built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module. For only $10 extra, I'd say the Wi-Fi edition of this board is a great option. In the past, I used a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth adapter that took up one of my PCIe expansion slots. These adapters are usually in the $30 range. But with the Pro RS Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi module is pre-installed directly onto the motherboard, which allows me to use my extra PCIe slots for other things. Features For Z-Series boards, one standout feature is CPU overclocking. On this board, I was easily able to get a good overclock on my Core Ultra 7 265K and DDR5 RAM. For overclocking, you must enter the OC Tweaker menu, which is in the Advanced Mode menu. Press F6 to enter the Advanced menu. Before overclocking, I'd recommend updating to the latest BIOS, as there have been some fixes recently. The current BIOS is 2.22, AS05 Beta. This BIOS fixed a small issue I ran into, and also includes the latest 0x114 microcode. Also, take note that when you update your BIOS, your old settings will be deleted. So, if you have saved an overclocking profile, make sure to write down your values. I have left the base frequency boost at auto and left the power delivery set to Intel default mode. To overclock the CPU, you must enter the CPU configuration menu. I left the P-Cores at stock, but I set the E-Core ratio to all core and changed the multiplier to 47, which sets the E-Cores to 4.7 GHz, which is a 100 MHz increase over stock. I then set the CPU cache ratio to 40, bringing the CPU cache to 4 GHz, which is a 200 MHz increase from stock. I set the NGU max OC ratio to 31, bringing that to 3.1 GHz, which is a solid 500 MHz increase over the stock 2.6 GHz clock. I have the GT frequency set to 2600. This is the integrated graphics clock. At stock, this was set to 2000, so a 600 MHz increase for the integrated graphics. That is a 30% increase. I set the CPU D to D ratio to 31, which brings that to 3.1 GHz. By default, the CPU D to D ratio is set to 2.1 GHz. So this is a massive 1 GHz increase. I left everything else in the menu alone at this point. Later, I will undervolt the cores in the CPU DLVR configuration menu. I'll put some time steps so you could jump to that point if you like. Overall, this is a huge improvement in clocks versus stock, and I am running all the cores, including the iGPU with a minus 60 millivolt offset, which allows for a decent amount of power savings from stock, while being clocked higher for more performance. 
for the RAM, I was able to go from an XMP clock of DDR5 6400 all the way up to DDR5 8200, a 28% increase in RAM speed. And I have tuned the timings to be even better than most similarly clocked RAM kits on the market, all while sticking to XMP voltages. When overclocking RAM, it is important to know which type of memory sticks you have. When buying RAM for overclocking, choose one that has the characteristics you're looking for. I have Hynix MDI, which is known to be able to clock high with good timings. Prior to overclocking the RAM, I loaded the XMP setting, Profile 1, which was 6400. Loading the XMP profile also sets the DRAM voltage to the XMP value. Even with this overclock, I kept the DRAM voltage at the XMP value. In my case, that is 1.4 volts for the DRAM modules. I increased the DRAM frequency to 8200, changed all of the primary timings, but for secondary and tertiary timings, I only changed a few things here and there, with the majority being set to auto. I changed nothing in the voltage menu, since I will be using the CPU DLVR configuration menu to set up the undervolt. In the CPU DLVR menu, I have set the VF offset mode for the cores set to selection and have changed the values to minus 60. This gives me a minus 60 millivolt undervolt on the cores. But I kept the last setting at auto for now. That last setting is for the 5.5 GHz 2 core boost. I also set the GT voltage offset to minus 60. This is the voltage supplied to the integrated graphics. I have my integrated graphics set to 2600 and so far it appears to be stable for me with this setting. I'm curious if it is common for 265K to reach a result like this. In my testing, I also found that I needed to undervolt the integrated graphics in order for it to sustain higher frequencies. After you change all your settings, make sure you save a profile, save and exit, and see if it works for you. Settings in this video are for my particular CPU, and there is a chance the values in this video won't work for you, since every CPU and DRAM kit has different characteristics. Overclocking can lead to some unintended outcomes if you're not careful. For me, it's great to have the ability to change voltages since I am using a Hyper212 Black Edition CPU cooler. I have lowered the voltages as much as possible to keep power consumption down, all while getting better than style performance. The two video ports on this board are very useful for me since I have two high refresh rate 1440p monitors. My vertical monitor is set to 120Hz and my horizontal monitor is set to 240Hz. Using this motherboard's HDMI and DisplayPort inputs, I am able to drive my monitors at their full resolution and refresh rates of 120 and 240Hz, giving me a very smooth experience while using my desktop. This is useful for me since I sometimes go months where I use integrated graphics, and I have found that the integrated graphics performance of Arrow Lake is very good with performance that is better than that of the PlayStation 4. I have been using the integrated graphics to play a lot of games recently, and in general, I find it useful to have a dual monitor setup, so it is nice that I can do that with the integrated graphics solution, driving both of my 1440p monitors to their full capabilities. For USB ports, I just need enough to use all of my peripherals, such as mouse, keyboard, and a USB DAC, which I use for Sony Philips Digital Interface Audio for my AV receiver. I don't need a massive amount of USB ports on the board itself since I can also make use of the USB hubs on both of my monitors. And on one of my monitors, I have added another USB hub, so it is unlikely that I'll ever run out of USB ports. One nice feature of this board is that it includes support for Thunderbolt on both of the Type-C ports. It is rare to see two Thunderbolt ports in this price range. 
I still use a number of SATA drives. So it is nice that this board includes four side mounted SATA ports that keep those cables out of the way. One other nice to have feature of Z890 is that you can add a PCIe Gen 5 SSD and not take away any lanes from your discrete graphics card. This board supports a total of four M.2 NVMe drives, one being PCIe Gen 5 and the other three being PCIe Gen 4. If you need more storage, you could add PCIe X4 add-in cards. For PCIe slots, it includes one PCIe Gen 5 slot for graphics and two PCIe Gen 4 x 4 slots. I use one of these slots for my capture card. Also included is a PCIe Gen 4 by one slot. The PCIe sizes reflect their true capability. On some boards, you'll see X4 rated slots have a full X16 slot with only X4 active. With this board, the X4 slots are correctly X4 sized. BIOS flashback is a nice to have feature in case something goes wrong when trying to flash a BIOS or in case you pair this motherboard with a CPU that was added later in the support list. Aesthetics With many cases having a tempered glass side panel, it is also a good idea to pick a motherboard and components that look good together. I ended up going with the white version of this motherboard since I thought that it would contrast nicely with the rest of my components. The ports on this board are in good positions which allows for easy cable management. This board also has some ARGB effects. I have set the RGB to a static color to match my capture card. You can change the color and choose from various different effects in the BIOS using the ASRock Polychrome RGB. If you don't like RGB, the feature can be turned off in the BIOS. Experience the BIOS layout is good. It is one I'm familiar with since I used the ASRock Z690 Steel Legend for several years previously. It allows for easy adjustments for CPU and RAM overclocking and voltage tuning. It's also easy to make adjustments to the fan speeds. I have five fans in my case. But I use two two fan splitters. So I would only need to adjust three settings in the BIOS to control all five of my case fans. I just left the fans at auto for now since the fans run very quietly on this BIOS without any input from me. Using the fan tuning, you can even lower the RPMs of non-PWM case fans. And you can save settings to several different profiles. I recommend saving to profiles, especially when overclocking, since if you mess up an overclock and have to clear CMOS, you will be up and running quicker with a profile already saved. There is also a CPU indicator feature in the BIOS that tells you your CPU silicon quality. Seems that I got a pretty good CPU this time. It says my CPU is in the top 1%. This board has great features for the price. The built-in Bluetooth and Wi-Fi saved me from using an internal adapter and the addition of it was only $10 more than the standard edition of this board. The board also has two Thunderbolt ports, which seem rare for a motherboard in this price range. PCIe Gen 5 SSD support is nice since it no longer takes away discrete graphics lanes. BIOS flashback is a nice feature in case you get a new CPU that would require a newer BIOS. Overclocking on this board, I was able to get better than stock performance while using less than stock power by overclocking while undervolting. The integrated graphics also sees a nice improvement from overclocking. In the end, this motherboard has every feature that I wanted for my PC. It goes very well with the rest of my components and comes in at a great price. There are a lot of great Z890 motherboard options out there. This one is definitely one of the better values.